Welcome to South Park City Museum, a 19th century mining town in 21st century Colorado. Today we have a ghost story to tell based in history and the tragic death of a local legend. One of the most recognizable buildings at the South Park City Museum is the three-story summer brewery standing just behind the visitor center. It is part of what was known in late 19th century and early 20th century fair play as part of the summer block. Today it is known as the home of the Bayou Salado exhibit and one of the most haunted buildings at South Park City. Who haunts South Park City? What's the story behind the ghost that has been seen there? Let's take a look at the tragic history of Leonard Summer, the man behind these historic buildings. Leonard Summer was a remarkable man. He immigrated from Austria in his early 20s with his brothers. Summer ended up learning the brewing business in Iowa, and as it turned out, he was very good at it. In March of 1873, at the age of 28, Leonard and his brother Joseph came to Fair Play. Leonard built his first brewery and opened for business. Six months later, on the night of September 26, 1873, Summer's new brewery burned to the ground along with most of the other structures on Front Street in the devastating Fair Play fire. The fire started on the second floor of a boarding house and destroyed over 50 buildings in town. Summer didn't have the money to rebuild after the fire, but undaunted, he left for Denver where he worked in the barley trades. By 1876, he had saved enough money to rebuild. Summer returned to Fair Play and began construction of a new two-story brewery near the location of his previous one, this time out of native red sandstone. At the peak of its production, the brewery was producing 45 to 50 kegs of beer a day. Summer's signature brew, South Park Lager, was very popular, being served as far away as Denver. He grew his businesses to include not only his brewery, but also a saloon, a man-made pond for ice harvesting, a grocery store, a smokehouse, and a hotel. He and his family lived on the second floor of the brewery for a time before they built their house next door. Later, Summer leased the brewery to two businessmen. Then in 1892, disaster struck and the brewery caught fire once more. It was gutted. But after his previous experience, Summer had been savvy enough to take out an insurance policy against fire. Summer bounced back yet again, restoring his brewery and even adding a third story. Mr. Summer and his wife Louise prospered and became an important part of the social and economic communities of Fair Play. Not one to shy away from civic duty, Summer purchased and donated a hose to the fire company. He also served as a delegate to the state democratic conventions, made the third floor of his brewery available to the community for use as a meeting place, and even offered up his pond for ice skating. Leonard was a respected member of the Fair Play community, regularly featured in local newspapers. He added new machinery to his brewery in 1885. He was elected constable of Fair Play in 1879. He hosted many dances and social gatherings. He planned to travel to Paris for the 1900 World's Fair, intending to display mineral samples from all over South Park. Sadly, Leonard Summer never made it to Paris. The final 15 years of Summer's life were fraught with difficulty. In 1892, another fire devastated his brewery. During the panic of 1893, silver prices plummeted, and Summer lost an enormous part of his fortune. He struggled for seven more years, then, in June 1900, Summer listed all of his property for sale or lease, with no response. On September 10, 1900, Leonard Summer committed suicide. Summer's obituary states that Mr. Joseph Sykes went up to the Summer place just before 6 o'clock intending to ask Mr. Summer over for supper and found him in the saloon behind the bar in a pool of blood. Sykes summoned the sheriff and a doctor. Summer was unconscious, but still alive. A 44 Bulldog revolver was found near his right hand and a straight razor was clutched tightly in his left. Summer's obituary states that his intention was probably to use the razor in case the revolver was unsuccessful. Summer had lost a great deal of blood and never regained consciousness. He was brought to his hotel across the street which had been forced to close only the day before. He died there at 11.30 a.m. the following day. Summer's obituary includes a description of his injury. It reads, The doctor upon examination found an ugly wound in the throat from which blood was flowing which showed where the bullet had entered, but there was no indication of its having come out. 
That the bullet had taken an upward course was evident from the fact that some of the teeth had been knocked out and the jawbone shattered. The doctor thinks the bullet was stopped by the cheekbone and that the force drove the bone into the brain which caused death. Summer was a well-loved member of the community. His obituary closes with sympathy for his family and states that Leonard Summer was of a kindly disposition, generous to a fault, and a loving and considerate father. So let us judge not lest ye be judged, but leave it to him to doeth all things well. His funeral, which took place in the parlor of his house, was well attended. Summer's body was displayed in his coffin for two days before he was taken to be buried at the Fair Play Cemetery. The marker on his grave has been lost to time and the elements. No one knows for sure, but this unknown grave next to the grave of his brother Joseph is thought to be Leonard Summer's final resting place. After his death, his ex-wife and his youngest daughter moved to Salida. His daughter, Adelia, stayed in Fair Play and reopened her father's hotel, trying to make a go of it. She ran the hotel as a boarding house until her death by accidental overdose of chloroform in 1907. The summer properties were finally sold at auction after her death. Five of Leonard Summer's buildings remain where they were originally built. The brewery, the smokehouse, the summer saloon, and his home, now known as the Pioneer House. Hundreds of visitors have walked through these buildings every week for the last 60 years. Accounts of a ghostly man in a dark suit, strange sounds, and even unexplained smells have been reported by visitors and staff nearly every year that the museum has been open. Is this the ghost of Leonard Summer? Did his tragic death somehow bind him to the place that he loved and struggled to keep? Or are there other explanations for these occurrences? No one knows for certain. Let's look at three reportedly haunted locations, and you can be the judge. Old buildings tend to have creaky floorboards. It would be quite difficult for anyone to sneak around, even a ghost. So when museum staff hear mysterious footsteps in the brewery while the museum is closed, it is enough to make someone think twice. One morning, while opening the buildings for the day, a museum employee heard footsteps overhead in the brewery. She froze, listening closely. If someone was walking around upstairs before the museum was open, it spelled trouble. After investigating, there was no one to be found in the still locked building. With no possible hiding places, she chalked it up to the old building settling, until she heard the footsteps again a few days later. Was it Leonard Summer walking through his brewery? While making her rounds one morning, another museum employee turned to see a man in a dark suit just leaving the room. Again, the museum hadn't yet opened for the day. Understandably rattled, fearing an intruder rather than anything spectral, she was shocked to find the next room a dead end, empty and quiet. There was nowhere the man could have gone without her seeing him, and, she realized, the man made no sound when he walked even on the creaky floorboards. She is convinced to this day that the man in the dark suit was Leonard Summer, checking up on his property. Footsteps are the most frequent unexplained activity reported in the brewery, but knocking and loud bangs have also been reported by employees and visitors, all during daylight hours. The scene of Leonard Summer's tragic suicide was just behind where the mineral exhibit stands today. Visitors to the exhibit have been startled out of their reveries by the sense that someone is standing right behind them, only to turn and find that no one is there. One summer in the mid-1990s, Fair Play police were called on several nights by locals reporting piano music coming from the direction of the saloon. The police investigated each time, only to find all of the buildings still locked up tightly and no explanation for the phantom music. Possibly the most haunted building at South Park City, the Pioneer Home was once the home of Leonard Summer. Built at the height of his success, his funeral took place here in the parlor on Thursday, September 12, 1900. Reports of unexplained activity in this house range from sounds of knocking, footsteps, and more frequently the strong, unmistakable smell of cigar smoke. The most recent encounter was in July 2020. The employee reported unlocking the house and being overwhelmed by the strong smell of cigar smoke to the point where it stopped her in her tracks. The scent then lingered for over 30 minutes. The main bedroom in the Pioneer House has been called the most haunted room in South Park City. A few years ago, a team of paranormal investigators spent a whole night taking readings throughout the museum. They logged the most activity in the main bedroom of the Pioneer House. 
They captured photographs of spirit orbs, caught EVPs on tape, and heard footsteps for themselves. Visitors frequently complain about electronics malfunctioning in the bedroom, only to work again when they leave the Pioneer House. So what do you think? Have you been to South Park City and had any strange experiences? Could there be scientific explanations for these ghostly encounters? Let us know in the comments. We'd love to hear from you. If you would like to visit these buildings in person, South Park City Museum is open from May 15th to October 15th every year. The museum welcomes visitors from all over the world. As a nonprofit, South Park City survives on proceeds from ticket sales and private donations. If you'd like to contribute to the restoration and preservation of this amazing place, the link to our donation page is below. If you are interested in history, more ghost stories, virtual tours, curiosities, local legends, and more, please hit that subscribe button and make sure to ring the notification bell so you don't miss a thing. Thanks for joining us. If you've enjoyed this video, please consider giving us a thumbs up. We'll see you next time.